So today, I will just briefly talk about our work using magnetic nanoparticles for molecular imaging and target drug delivery applications. Uh, as we know, drug development is a very lengthy and expensive process. Uh, on average, it's being estimated that to develop a new medicine takes about 12 to 15 years, with estimated costs ranging from $800 million to $2 billion. So a lot of the drug candidates fail, not because of lack of efficacy, many times due to off-target set of uh, toxicities. So the trend in the field is that um, is towards moving towards personalized medicine. The idea is that to deliver the right treatment to the right person at the right time and to the right location, instead of this more traditional one-size-fits-all approach. So uh, we want to make drugs like this arrow that can hit the bullseye, hit the disease side at the right time. Uh, the important aspect of this is also uh, biomedical and cellular imaging. So this can provide useful information on molecular events occurring at disease sites. And that's important so that we can stratify in patients and make sure the drugs deliver to the right site and then can monitor the, the effect of the drug on the disease progression. So my group's approach uh, in this area is that we will use nanoparticles and the ones we are particularly interested in are magnetic nanoparticles. So we can synthesize this type of particles in the laboratory. And what we do after having the particle is that we'll put on targeting agents uh, to target the diseases. And here, just one example, uh, it's a polysaccharide called a hyaluronan, and it can target cancer cells, can target inflammation. So we'll coat hyaluronan on a nanoparticle and make this type of targeting nanoparticle. And then we we'll perform a lot of cellular studies in the laboratory, make sure the particles that can severely target the desired target. Uh, if that works well, well then we we'll go to in vivo. Uh, so far, we've been primarily focused on using uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Um, the path certainly is a very exciting direction we can go, and we'll briefly talk about that. So if this works very well, then because nanoparticles have a very large, large surface area, so we can put drugs, we can put you know, other agents on the nanoparticle, and you, know, if, you, know, you can look at the <coughs> application of this type of particle for treatment. So next couple of slides, I'll just give you one quick example of the type of project we carry on in the group. And this is related to atherosclerosis. <coughs> so we know atherosclerosis is a silent complex inflammatory disease of the artery with something called a plaque uh, growing there in the artery. So here's the schematic showing the plaque growing in the artery. Here. So there's some plaques that have a tendency to rupture. When they rupture, they happen in the heart, that can cause heart attack. And this rupture happening in the brain can cause stroke. And we know this uh, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in, in the world. And so far, it's been very difficult to predict what kind of plaques can rupture and to detect the, what we call vulnerable plaques. Uh, so uh, it's our goal that to, we, can, we want to develop nanoparticle probes to image the plaque and hopefully try to predict the risk for rupture. And this project is in collaboration um, with David Drew, radiologist, also Chen Qi, Chen is here from radiology, uh, also Georgia Bella from cardiology, and Matty Kubel from DC Powell, uh, looking at pathology. So uh, Georgia, George Bella has this really nice rabbit model um, for atherosclerosis. Basically what they do is they will injure the rabbit aorta using a balloon, trying to mimic the hum in the human process the injury to the artery. And after that, uh, they will feed the rabbit with resonant dial, and I can leave you to imagine what's in the resonant dial for the rabbit. <laughs> Um, uh, after a couple of months, the rabbit would de develop extensive atherosclerosis, and then when this model is ready, we'll inject our particles, and David and Chen Qi will help us uh, do the imaging in the imaging rabbit to, to detect the presence of plaque. And this is the only data slide to quickly show you. And this is a, a MRI image, T2 strawberry image of a live rabbit, and this is the aorta. This is the main artery in the peritoneal cavity. Just by this image, it's, um, the image looks very similar disease rabbit and the normal rabbit, it cannot tell the presence of plaque. And now when we inject our nanoparticles, I hope we can see uh, in selected areas, then the wall become dark. That's due to the, we think it's due to the nanoparticle binding effect, binding to the wall, and cause loss of signal become black. Okay. And this effect lasts more than 17 hours, 17 hours you can still observe this. And then after 100 hours, the particles get cleared and then return to our normal pre-injection levels. So let me just show you one example that we can use our probe to help us detect the presence of plaque. Um, the, the challenge for the, this approach is that uh, it's, it's, because of loss of signal here, it's really uh, hard to confirm that this is due to nanoparticle plaque. So we follow up with a lot of histology studies. 
So it'd be really cool that if you can do dual modality imaging, right, combine MRI to <coughs> sample with PET, and here's a, a sample picture I took out of this European Heart Journal paper, and this is what they use FDG as PET tracer. And it's not specific to plaque, right? it just detects, uh, as Rushi was talking about, areas that uh, have high metabolism. And this is the other area you can see the, the, you know, this PET imaging. So if you co combine all those, that would be really powerful to help us uh, determine the pathology. So uh, that's the science part I want to talk about. And then I just briefly talk about uh, what we envision, at least from chemistry side of things, what we can do with the free isotopes. So besides the exciting nuclear physics applications, uh, we think about it, it can be applied to, for example, heterogeneous catalysis. And a lot of my colleagues here are in catalysis, for example, APO. One of the top about applications in this, uh, my colleague Mitch there, they'd be happy to talk to you about this. Uh, and it uh, can be used to study metallic enzymes, for example. And biomedical applications, we can use for molecular imaging. Um, you know, because we have many isotopes, you can also use mass spec tags as tags for high screening, you can use for uh, radiotherapeutics. Uh, but what are the challenges, especially with the chemistry? As David just talked about, FRIP is so powerful, you make so many different nuclei. Right? So one big challenge is that, so how to separate this and get the compound, the isotope out in sufficient chemical purity and isotopic purity. Right? So isotopic separation is a big need on campus, and, and hopefully with the young man here there, Greg Severin, is a faculty candidate <laughs> with me a second trip, and hopefully he will sign a lot of line before you leave. <laughs> 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 that will help address uh, the issue in uh, isotope separations. And also, you know, we need expertise in radiochemical synthesis. How do we make the probe, design and make the probes? And many also the probes are uh, metals, right? So how do we design ligands <laughs> as radioactive metals? Okay, that's my last slide. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Brent. Yeah, do you, when you synthesize the spions, do you start from the um, IM2 and IM3? Yes. Or do you synthesize the in-house? And how long does that process take? Uh, the particle itself is uh, 24, less than 24, less than one day. Okay. And then we will coat them with the polymers and that take a few days for purification. Okay. Yeah. So that process can be shortened. Yeah, and how efficient is the entire process? Or iron. Uh, well, we never calculate because the iron two iron three salt two is very cheap, right? So, are you thinking about using radioactive iron two? No, right. No, well, you can you can uh, use zirconium and iron will form the it will form in the spion bonds. Sorry, zirconium will bind in there. So, you can, if you start from a preformed uh, particle, there are ways to get zirconium in. But if you're starting from the non-preformed particles, you have an advantage in being able to load zirconium in, for example, and we have a good pet tracer of zirconium. But the three-day half life. Okay, so yeah, that's definitely can come to talk about that. Yeah. The process can be streamlined as well. So far, it hasn't been an issue for us. That was not the way to decide for us. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.